Good evening and welcome to George Eastman House. Like most museums, we are a museum of stuff. And the stuff we take care of is right here at 900 East Avenue. And indeed, it is here at 900 East Avenue because our history is inextricably entwined with the history of Rochester, the history of photography, the, the legacy of George Eastman. Um, we are here because since the 1880s, Rochester has been the center of the photographic universe. We are not the Museum of Local Photographers, but some of the local photographers are just so good that it is our pleasure to get to know them, to be familiar with their work, and to put it on the walls to share with all of you. So now I'm going to quickly go through three body, my recent bodies of work that I've, I've done. This one, uh, the first several pictures, I was lucky enough to work for a while for the World Bank, uh, which is a large nonprofit, really, and in, is, in the biz is not a commercial bank, but in the business of poverty alleviation around the world. It's a huge organization funded by the wealthier countries for the benefit of the poorer countries. Uh, this trip, I went with them to Haiti. This is a man using just a little, a little saw, uh, and he's cutting a horn, uh, cow horns in this case, which he will actually make into a shoehorn, which the light went on for me that um, you could do that. The shoehorn was made from horn in this case. These men are wrangling this log um, in order to do this, to, to cut it. Um, no, no sawmill around. No resource. It's a country just without without resources or, or infrastructure. So they have this this seven foot long two handle saw that they will cut this log down so that other people can make these uh, tourist tchotchkes that are sold on the uh, more prosperous islands of the Caribbean where people go on vacation. That work is outsourced to Haiti where the, where the, where the work is, is cheap, where the labor is cheap. And here you can see these are some of the, their tools, their, their gouges that they use in the woodworking, and, um, and that even they are handmade. There's really, you can't buy anything. Another trip, well, there were two trips to Peru, one to the Andes and this one to the Amazon region. Uh, and this is a tributary of the Amazon called the Urubamba. And you can see in, in, the, in the bank of the river that steps had been cut into it so that at low, when the river was low, I guess it's not low tide, but the river was low, you could climb up. And the village is up on top, at the top of the stairs, and you can see the better part of a goat standing right there. And so we docked our boat and went up those stairs. And this is what we found, that you had to cross this pond on these logs. And you know, I had this big camera case and a tripod. And you know, even without that stuff, I wouldn't have been so good at it. But they got me across, and we went to the village. And this is a view into one of, the, um, one of their, their houses, one of their huts, you know, elevated against the, the rains that would come at another time of year, and sleeping in hammocks. And you can see perhaps a girl in a, uh, in a skirt and a white blouse, long black hair. She attends school. They have a half-day school that the central government uh, created for them. And, and, and she just got home from that and is changing back into her other clothes. The, the, the parents in front um, are, uh, are wearing clothing that, is, that, that really defines the tribe they belong to, the Shipibo Kanibo. And you will see, uh, the, especially the pattern on their skirts, reappear in their uh, pottery and, and in other things that they do. And, you know, no two are alike, but they're all the same kind of pattern, uh, which has a symbolic history, which no one could really be sure about. And some of their pots are anthropomorphic, and some are not. And um, they used the resin from a, a, a tree that grew there to, to paint the inside of them to provide a little bit of waterproofing 
uh, for the pots to help so that they could hold, hold water. And um, the child in the foreground is simply you know, the change that's inevitable even in the jungle that they're wearing really discarded Western clothing that gets taken down there. And this is Bhutan, which is a buffer state, uh, the north end of India, the south end of Tibet, comma, China, um, where you can see, the, which is a Buddhist kingdom, and the, the fellow there, the little Quasimodo figure, is spinning that prayer wheel, the, the round thing that you see there, and he's shuffling back and forth between that prayer wheel and another one to accumulate uh, merit for the, uh, the life to come. And the, um, the architecture and its decoration is traditional and is now required by law on new buildings that new buildings look that way even if they're not constructed with the same technology as part of a wide-ranging effort to maintain their identity. It's a small country, populate, size about Switzerland, population of plus or minus a million. So they make a real effort to try to stay Bhutanese. Here's an older craftsman making, uh, turning on a lathe, a little wooden cup that would ultimately be for, for wine or tea. It would be, the inside would be lined with silver. It would be hammered, very beautiful cups. And here, is, here he is with his wife in a kind of Bhutan Gothic. And you can see even in their car hearts, their regular work clothes, they're wearing the traditional garb, which is another law that in public you must wear traditional garb. His is a little shorter, hers is longer. And they don't have purses or schlepsacks. And so it, the clothes are just a big rectangle. And you know, you wrap them around in the way that you do. And then you cinch it at the waist and, and pull it up and make a pouch. And that's where you, know, you would put your, your teacup and your, um, your iPad and, and you know, 